So welcome everyone for this special seminar. Thanks for attending. Uh, we're going to use the microphone because we're recording. So uh, that will allow our colleagues that are already in holidays or those that are working but not here to uh, later on uh, uh, catch up with uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this seminar. So it's our pleasure today, uh, uh, Thomas and myself, to welcome uh, Bilge uh, Demirkos. Uh, so, Bill, she's a professor in uh, Ankara at the Middle East Technical University, so in Turkey. She did her PhD in Oxford and then she moved to CERN. She's working the line being uh, uh, an astrophysicist or high energy uh, uh, particle physicist uh, and uh, uh, trying to also see what's the impact on uh, space assets, uh, humans uh, in, in the uh, up there in the space, uh, in the, the uh, space station, for example. Uh, so Thomas took the initiative to say, well, this is exactly one of the things that we would like to do in the department, right? To try to walk that line too. And so because Hilsch was here, Bilsch was here in Belgium, uh, we took the opportunity to welcome her. So I'll give you the floor, correct uh, anything that I said that uh, does not please you. And then we are looking forward to your uh, seminar. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today in Leuven to visit my old friend Thomas and to meet all of you today here. Um, it might surprise you to put uh, space and accelerating technologies under the same center. Uh, but we thought, it, we thought about this a lot and we decided that it was the right thing to do to give us enough breath and possible flexibility for uh, finding money. Uh, and students and resources to do uh, interesting stuff. And so why did we do this and how did we justify it? So uh, when you talk about space and accelerating technologies, the first thing that you notice is that there is a very big similarity in operating conditions. Obviously, there is high radiation in both environments. Um, there's quite a high vacuum in space and inside LHC and Isolde and other experiments. And there's quite high temperature variations. Um, the next is that we have uh, quite a bit of similarity in design requirements. Uh, both require um, electronic tolerances to be excellent. Um, uh, both require fast feedback loops uh, and low latency and error rates. Next is the similarity in operating conditions. Um, so limited access. We have very limited access to space and accelerators. Um, uh, the data transfer rates can be quite high in both, and data processing requirements could be really time consuming and heavy as well for both. Um, and as for safety, um, again, there's quite a few requirements for human health and safety concerns, and what you'd like is you'd like a long and safe lifetime and for this very quite expensive equipment for both. So our lab was first founded. I returned back to, back home. I'm Turkish. I uh, spent 14 years abroad uh, at MIT, at Oxford, at CERN, as uh, Professor kindly mentioned. Um, and I returned back to tr home to Turkey in 2012. Uh, and I uh, and our lab was founded in 2015 after I received a Marie Curie uh, reintegration grant. Uh, and uh, and then we became a university research, research center in 2019. And we have now to, ab, ab, uh, over 20 people working at the center. And we have a, a synergy between space and accelerating ex, or accelerator technologies. So what do we do? Uh, the first thing is uh, AMS. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer is on the International Space Station. It's a particle physics experiment to and understand cosmic rays, and uh, the search for a dark matter signal or a better understanding of it. And that's our fundamental science perspective. The next is where we actually got the money. Uh, and that's the Metu DBL project, the Metu D Focusing Beamline project, where we uh, got a, about 2.5 million euro grant uh, to, build, uh, to, uh, to do radiation dose predictions for Turkish satellites and to perform radiation, to build a facility to do radiation tests uh, with 13 to 30 MeV protons according, according to the ASA standard. And the third leg is now, we got another about 1.5 million euros to do uh, 
I'm just mentioning this because Uga, Uga is interested in the money, so <laughs> as department head. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, for the development of radiation monitors and shielding materials uh, for space. And now we're actually uh, considering hospitals as well. We started to do a little bit with hospitals as well. So our group consists of four physicists, five engineers, three technicians, one administrative staff, uh, four PhD and three master's students. And uh, we're always looking for more students, if anyone's interested. Um, so uh, just a reminder for anybody who uh, may be outside the field, uh, cosmic rays uh, hit our atmosphere all the time. They come from stars, from uh, interstellar sources as secondaries. And when they reach our atmosphere, they come and they uh, shower inside this beautiful atmosphere, which, protect, which protects us from much of this radiation. And we get very little of it down here on Earth. Um, so um, what are these primaries? These primaries uh, are the ones that, re that um, end up producing radiation on Earth are mostly primaries that are uh, mostly protons going very close to the speed of light. Unfortunately, we don't get them on, our, on Earth, right? Because they're destroyed in this atmosphere. So if you want to understand cosmic rays, you want to go to space. And uh, going to space is expensive, as even though it's getting cheaper. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit. But here is the International Space Station. Um, and on this international space, uh, so, so ha have, have you seen it? Has everyone seen it? Oh, that's great. I'm very happy. Yeah, it's, it's quite bright. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy. This is, I've never seen so many people say yes in a crowd before. So this is, this is special for me. Thank you. Um, um, excuse me? Astronomers. Astro oh, yes, astronomers. OK. I'm, I'm very silly. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, when I do this to particle physicists, they go, no. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, the International Space Station is quite big. Uh, from one end to the other end, it's like a football field. It's quite big. Um, and uh, one of the largest payloads, one of the largest scientific payloads up there is the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. Alpha, because that's the code name, uh, call name for uh, the International Space Station. Magnetic, and that's very important. The most important word here is magnetic. We have a magnet, which helps us distinguish particles which are negative from positively charged. And the third one is a spectrometer, which means it, it helps us separate not only charged particles, but also in terms of mass. Right. Um, so we've been up there in space since uh, 2012. I, I worked. So uh, I, for those of you who are young, this is a story, a little story on never to give up. Uh, I worked on building AMS from 2000 to 2004 while I was a student at MIT. And then anybody, you probably don't remember, but there was a shuttle accident. A Columbia disintegrated as it was returned back to Earth. And I was a grad student. And we were going to be on the next third, like a couple of flights down. You know, it, it was tragedy that those, so many people were lost. But then it was also tragic that I didn't have a PhD thesis anymore. Um, so after working on it for four years, I left. Uh, I wrote up a master's thesis, because you have to finish the experiment that you were working on before you can graduate. And I worked on Atlas for eight years. And I met Toma, and I was at CERN. And then right as I'm coming back home to Turkey, this thing is going up. So I went back and I said, I want to go back on it. <laughs> so um, it's a story of, uh, I think, never giving up hope on your dreams. So uh, ever since it's been spa in space, we're, we're now working with the data. And my students are now working with the data, which is really exciting. Um, it's also, to me, it's a story of how if you really work on something, that, that work never goes to waste. And so I hope that's the story of hope. Um, it'll come back to you somehow. So, um, so it did for me. Uh, there are some skeptics I hear. Uh, <laughs> let Let's show the youngsters the you know the happy uh, feelings now today. Okay, May two thousand twelve, um, and we've been in space since then. We've collected billions and billions of particles, and here uh, is a photo at CERN 
we built it at CERN. Uh, of course, uh, different part, different detectors were built in different parts of the world, as I'll show you. But it came together. It was integrated at CERN on the Prevasan site. Uh, this is a photo from there. It has about 300,000 electronic channels. It has 650 processors on board, and it's about five tons. And the, the, you will notice that it's in feet because NASA took it to space. Um, here is the Dawn at launch pad. We're one of the last payloads to go up to space with the space shuttle, uh, next to last flight, actually. Uh, we went up on Endeavour. Uh, here we are in the cargo bay. And this is the team that took us to space, a crew of six, not of seven, as that changed. And here is a little uh, statistics that I love to show because it's really interesting. And this is showing actually what, what's changing, what, 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 what is SpaceX changing, okay? So Endeavour, which, this, which is this uh, shuttle that takes off like a rocket but lands like a, lands like a or, or did land like a plane, uh, that thing was 110 tons at takeoff. Uh, the external tank, which is orange, which burns oxygen and uh, uh, hydrogen, was 756 tons, and that you know goes down into the ocean. And then these two solid rocket boosters on the side, those were 1142 tons, and they, that again goes into the ocean uh, once it's burnt. And the total takeoff weight is 2,008 tons. Why? Because you wanted to take 7.5 tons to space. So going to space is one of the least efficient things that humanity does if we're looking at it from a chemical perspective. <laughs> when you show this to chemists, they go, that's wrong. <laughs> okay, so this is being disrupted right now, but not by a lot because gravity works its magic. Okay, so here, here we are at takeoff, uh, 16th of May, 2011, and here we are installed in an international space station. So it's a collab international collaboration in the spirit of several CERN experiments. It is a particle physics experiment and similar to all other CERN experiments, honestly. It's just in space. And the control room is at CERN as well. So you could think of it as Atlas CMS in the, in the, or the, the, the it's generally um, accepted to be in a very similar manner, okay, uh, in, a, in terms of um, collaboration style. Um, so our collaboration is led by MIT, and we have several countries uh, and institutes collaborating on, right now, the operations and analysis of AMS. So my group, we're working on several things. Uh, so initially, we worked on colorimetric and conversion mode photon flux measurements. And then we worked on uh, electron-positron ratios, and we're now working on identification of electromagnetic showers using machine learning, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And we've worked on uh, proton and helium flux and variability from the sun. So here is the, internet, uh, here's the uh, AMS control room at CERN. Should you be coming to CERN, drop me a line. I'll give you a tour. Um, and why are we doing this? So since Dr. Hess discovered cosmic rays in 1912, there has been five Nobel Prizes awarded to cosmic rays. Lots of particles have been discovered in cosmic rays before accelerators came along. And there is no reason why we, can't, we may not be able to find new particles up there. And uh, certainly, uh, the accelerator of the universe is bigger than any accelerator we might build here on Earth. So let's use it. So um, as you know, fundamental science on the International Space Station has been done uh, for a long time uh, now. Um, but neutral cosmic rays, JWST, Hubble, there has been quite a few, uh, I understand there's a lot of astronomers amongst you, so we've been looking at neutral cosmic rays for a long time. Why not look at charged cosmic rays? So right now, in 2023, the International Space Station is looking at another 70 years at least on the International Space Station. Um, it, it might get extended up to 2032, I'm told, uh, so we might have another nine years, maybe. Uh, in those nine years, we want to have an upgrade, extend our coverage in um, solid angle to be able to see even more particle physics, uh, more, more cosmic rays in the next two years. So we're, we're, we're about to have an upgrade in two years. So we, if, we, if we increase our coverage, we'll have even more statistics. So what is our current... Um, 
what does our current detector look like? We're about a meter square, meter square is the radian right now. Um, so we are like a sieve sitting on the International Space Station and cosmic rays fly right through us, some of them stopping in front of the, of course, the AMS detector. At the top of the uh, AMS, we see a transition radiation detector, which helps identify electrons and positrons away uh, from, hold on, right. So this is the transition radiation detector. You see it here. That's a, it's like a honeycomb structure uh, with a radiator, which uh, only electrons uh, and positrons radiate inside this detector, producing some X-rays which are detected by proportional gas tubes uh, amongst them. Uh, and that help, helps us identify electrons and positrons away from the dominant proton background. So at high energies, the protons overwhel overwhelm uh, the, proto uh, the, the, the protons overwhelm the positron and electron flux at high energies. Uh, then at the top here, called one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, we have a silicon. We have silicon tracker layers. Uh, as the particle curves inside this magnetic field on the outside, so our magnetic field goes like this, and the particles curve like this or like this, depending on whether it's positive or negative. And here, uh, here and here, there we have a time of flight counter. So here you see the scintillator detectors. And the scintillator detectors detect the passage of the particle with a time resolution better than 140 feet, picoseconds, which lets us see how close the particle is going to the speed of light. And from there, we can understand, we can measure beta and its uh, charge and uh, so that gives us information, valuable information, on the, the charge of the particle as well as the energy of the particle. And here at the bottom, we have a ring imaging Cherenkov counter. You see here, it's made of aerogel and mirrors. And when a particle passes through this aerogel, it goes faster than the speed of light in that medium, which then, uh, which then, um, uh, which and, and from the angle that the particle, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the particle, as it goes through this material, it goes faster than the speed of light, makes a Cherenkov cone, and this Cherenkov shock cone has an angle, and this angle then tells you uh, the beta, again, or the energy of the particle, and also the, the charge of the particle. And at the very bottom, uh, we have the part. Of the, we have the detector that we're concentrating on right now, which is the electromagnetic colorimeter. And the electromagnetic colorimeter shown here it has a z and a, uh, has, measures the charge of the particle as well as the momentum, or, uh, as well as the energy of the particle. And also, uh, the our electromagnetic colorimeter has a good resolution for gamma rays as well. Uh, so gamma rays that pass through and made a shower here are seen, as well as electrons and positrons, which make a shower. But protons generally do not leave a shower as they're hadronic particles. And we do electron-positron separation here. So in summary, we can look at the, the data signature of various particles in each detector. So electrons, for example, leave uh, a series of um, X-rays and signals in the transition radiation tracker, a small um, uh, deposition in the time of flight. They curve a certain way in the tracker and the magnet. They leave uh, a clean, a small, uh, sharp image in the ring imaging Cherenkov counter and shower in the electromagnetic colorimeter, while a proton leaves very little signal in the transition, uh, doesn't leave any X-rays in the transition radiation detector. Uh, leaves more signal in the time of flight, curves the other way, leaves a similar image in the ring imaging Cherenkov counter, but leaves a very small energy deposition in the electromagnetic colorimeter. So this is how we separate the different detectors. We need all of them working in unison to be able to distinguish which particle it is. I'll, I'll take questions. This is generally where I have all the questions. No questions from astronomers. Great. All right. Um, so what we're interested in 
uh, especially is dark matter. My group is very interested in dark matter, and for dark matter, we need for the dark matter signal, uh, we need to be able to distinguish protons from positrons. And so these are the this is where we're looking at. And unfortunately, the, the, the transition radiation detector stops being able to separate uh, positrons from protons about one tera electron volts because a proton also makes transition radiation about one tera electron volt. Therefore, the, tra the transition radiation detector's um, power to separate those two particles stops at one TV. So we need to rely solely on the electromagnetic colorimeter about one TV, and that's why we're working on it right now. So, the electro the, so this is why I'm going to spend one more slide on the electromagnetic colorimeter. It's a lead scintillating fiber um, uh, colorimeter running in one. Uh, so you have, you have fibers running in one direction, followed by fibers running in the other direction, uh, and you have photomultiplier tubes at the end. So what happens when a particle showers inside here, uh, the, electro the electron or the positron will shower inside the, uh, the lead, but will deposit, um, will deposit a light inside the scintillating fibers. And these fibers, you see, they, have a, they are one millimeter thick and uniformly distributed inside 1,200 uh, pounds of lead. And you see here one cell, uh, a cell of nine by nine millimeter squares. So in the end, we end up measuring the shower shape as well as the total energy deposition of the particle. And so we have a 3D imaging capacity in this large volume, and that corresponds to about 17 radiation lengths, which is important to understand uh, which our stopping power. So we have 18 cells for depth and 72 cells in the x on the y axis. We have 18 layers, 10 for the x axis and 8 for the y axis. So when a particle passes through AMS, it looks a bit like this at the top. The transition radiation detector identifies as an electron. Then here, it goes through the uh, silicon, and we measure the momentum uh, from the tiny uh, deviation away from a straight line. And we measure the momentum of the particle like that. And then here in the ring imaging Cherenkov counter, we confirm that it's an electron. And at the bottom, uh, the electromagnetic colorimeter, we measure the particle's energy, the total energy, as it showers. So, for example, when we measured this back in 2012, this is the first one of the first two elect one of the first electrons we saw uh, was a 424 GV positrons, and at the time this was one of the highest positrons seen. Um, it made the cover of the Physical Review letters back then in 2013, and our first measurement of uh, AMS of the of the uh, precision measurement of the positron fraction. Uh, with respect to protons, uh, uh, was uh, selected for viewpoint. So our first paper uh, already showed, uh, so on the x-axis we have the positron or the electron energy, and on the y-axis we have the positron fraction. For, so positron fraction, what it means is that, uh, what it means is the positron fraction is the number of positrons divided by the number of uh, electrons plus positrons. So, um, so that's called the positron fraction. And uh, we, what, what had happened before us was that Fermi had shown some, that there might be an increase at high energies uh, as you go towards high energies with large error bars uh, of the positron fraction. So we showed very clearly in 2013 that indeed there was an, there was an increase with, low, uh, with high statistics, and this is from our paper uh, two years ago, and we're about to publish again, by the way, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Sorry, can't show that yet. Um, well, we're we're going to update this result, actually, in a few weeks, so keep, out, keep an eye out for it. Um, so what we have shown right now is that this is energy on the, on the, on the x-axis, so 110, 100 GeV, a, a TeV is here, and on the, on the on the y-axis, what you see, this, so this is uh, e to the third power. We do this to uh, because you know that it, it, the almost all particles are falling with because of the due to Fermi acceleration. They're falling with e to the power of minus two point seven. Uh, so you multiply by e to the th third power to have a more flat spectrum to be able to 
show deviations away from that. And so this is GV squared per meter squared steradian per steradian per second. And what we expected for, from positrons, from interstellar collisions, and we also measure the proton spectrum, we measure helium and all other spectra, so we have a good understanding of what the diffuse spectrum should like, look like, meaning you produce positrons, right? Also in interstellar medium, as cosmic rays have a chance of hitting each other, right, colliding with each other in the interstellar medium, so that's what the diffuse term means, okay? The diffuse term is what you would get as positrons from secondaries. But well, what you see clearly is that beyond the diffuse term, there seems to be a source term, and we, do a, we can do a good fit to this. So, um, of course, you will you wonder, not only do we see an increase, but we also see a fall-off. Right? Fermi had already also only seen an increase, but not a fall-off. We see a fall-off, and you might wonder, where does it, you see that the slope turns here. So where does the slope turn? Okay, so we can look at the slope and you will find that the slope has a zero crossing of 275 plus or minus 32 GeV. Okay? So we have a motivation to understand this. Why do we have a, because we want to understand what this is. Is this dark matter? Is this a sign of dark matter? Annihilation in the galactic halo? Or is this some other astrophysics thing? Is this, is this, there's, if you look on literature right now, there's so many, I was just telling Toma, there's so many, it's, there's a variety of theory papers trying to explain this, okay? And uh, the, the most, from, I'm told, of course, from astrophysicists, that the most, one of the most credible theories is that it's pulsars uh, ejecting positrons in the, in the, into the interstellar medium. And if so, this fall-off should be nice and smooth, I'm told by, again, the papers project that this should have, like, uh, because it's an accelerating mechanism, because it's an a bit like the Fermi acceleration, it should have a soft and smooth fall-off. But if it's a particle, like dark matter, which is annihilating in a galactic halo, it should have a cutoff. So if you do a fit, and you wonder what this looks like right now, this should be a, this looks to be like, uh, this would point, this is the best fit, of course. Um, I'm not saying this is true, right? This is, this is with, with large error bars, yes. Uh, this looks to be, this could be, this could be, it, it's a possibility that this is a 1.2 tera electron volt dark matter candidate, which then could annihilate and give you these positrons. Uh, so right now, it looks consistent with the dark matter model, but it also looks consistent with pulsars. So this is why we want to collect data in the, uh, on the International Space Station until the end, but also with a larger, uh, larger um, detector. And we'll have an upgrade which will take us from one meter square steradian to three meter square steradian uh, in two years from today. And we're also working on uh, modern, I would say modern, uh, and uh, ways to understand our colorimeter right now. In our for our colorimeter, we're using basic, quite basic. What what, what is quite basic um, ways to distinguish positrons from protons? We're using uh, BDTs, boosted decision trees, and likelihoods. And now we're looking looking into my group. This is this is the recent work from my group. We haven't published it yet. This is Monte Carlo only, but we have shown. So the x-axis is the electron efficiency, the y-axis is proton rejection. And so at 90% electron efficiency, our current models give us about 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 uh, proton rejection. We have shown that with uh, multi-layer MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons, ResNets, which are residual neural networks, CNNs, which are convolutional neural networks, you do better. But we have shown uh, in our recent thesis, is that convolutional vision transformers, which maybe, I don't know if you heard about, anybody heard about CVTs? All right, you're gonna hear about it a lot in the next five years. This is, this is if you, if you give, you know, when you prompt some, you know, there's now a lot of things where you can prompt, uh, show me a horse flying in the ocean somewhere and uh, some uh, other planet, okay, and it gives you some, uh, it generates 
So these are mostly CVTs. So CVTs are now, I'm told by my colleagues that I collaborate with in our computer science department, this is what's revolutionized what uh, graphic designers are doing and what um, all that all these amazing things you see uh, on Twitter or <laughs> elsewhere, Instagram. Uh, so most most of that is really so somehow. And what's what's new about CVTs is that it has attention. So unlike the other models, which try to learn from the from this whole picture, CVTs goes and looks and focuses attention on a certain feature. And somehow this attention focusing is it's quite similar to what humans do, right? We focus, I'm looking at you, you know this, right? So somehow the act of focusing your attention gives an additional uh, advantage. Same thing is true for identifying particles. So I, 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 may I uh, please suggest you look at CVTs, they're amazing things. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm really taken with this. Um, so um, we've done this work and we've shown that we get a nearly a factor of a, a thousand uh, improvement uh, in our rejection. And of course, this is only on Monte Carlo. So it has to be taken with a grain of salt, more than a grain of salt. Uh, we're right now running on test beam data. Before we sent AMS to space, we had uh, we ran test beams with electrons, positrons, and protons at CERN at 450 GeV and other energies. So right now we're evaluating our models on test beam data, and then we'll evaluate them on uh, uh, flight data. All right, I think I'm, I'm taking too much time. So, I'm, so <laughs> AMS is uh, publishing now uh, data of all, all the energy spectra uh, up to iron. So we're sensitive up to iron in cosmic rays, and we're publishing them one by one. Uh, we published up to silicon and iron, but not these elements. We're waiting for more statistics on those. We also look at things like solar flares. Um, these are very important, especially for the International Space Station, for Mars travel. Uh, so we're studying uh, how the geomagnetic environment of the sun affects the geomagnetic environment of the Earth. I mean, we have a very good handle on it because we can see it in a large energy spectrum. So when you look at the space environment, Earth's space environment, in the low Earth orbit, uh, you find that you will get about 1 to 10 kilorads of radiation per year. In Mayo, where, for example, Galileo is, based, you'll find you'll get about 100 times that amount. And if you look at GEO, where geostationary uh, satellites are, you'll get about 10 times that. Um, it looks a bit funny, right? Because the, as with altitude, if x axis is altitude and y axis is a dose, you find a bit of a hunchback, right? Uh, a camel back. And the reason for that is that the Earth's radiation belts are a bit lopsided due to the fact that the Earth's rotational axis is different than its magnetic axis. And this makes for uh, radiation belts, there, that, that there is an inner radiation and an outer radiation belt, and you'll get this uh, camel, camel side. And you'll get different particles. You get electrons and part, protons, a bit, a bit segregated. So when you look at radiation, so what does it do to your satellites or your assets in space? And that's very important, and that's, as I said, that's where we get our money. We get very little money for AMS. We get our funding mostly from understanding radiation effects in space. And, we, and I fund my grad students working on AMS actually through that effort. So, um, well, the first thing is ionizing effects. So when particles go through your materials, the first thing it does is ionization. So, depend, of course, a lot of things go through your so all the particles that I mentioned now, all the periodic table goes through your satellites. Uh, but you can look at the sum of all the effect, and you can say this is a, called a total ionizing effect. And then you can say this is makes for a total dose. And this total dose you can give to your electronics. You can test them. And you can do this with cobalt-60 gamma source. So that's, the, that's really the entry level 
to radiation, understanding radiation effects. The next thing you can do is you can say, well, electrons, most of them stopped outside my, outside the, most of the electrons stop on the, outside the uh, satellite in the, in the uh, structure of the satellite, the, uh, some of them on the solar panels. Um, so if you have electronics inside your satellite, if it receives a particle, it's probably a proton. So you, then you can do your tests with protons. But what really gives the highest amount of damage is oxygen, carbon, and all the way out to, uh, to iron, because you know that radiation damage goes with Z squared. So you also have to look at these uh, particles, and that's called, so the signal effect, event effects happen generally when one of these particles, a proton or a heavy ion, goes through your electronics, changes your zeros and ones. And the non-ionizing effects, or called displacement damage, actually changes the structure of your semiconductor devices as it displaces atoms inside. So one of the first things we did is we started calcul calculating radiation doses for Turkish satellites. Here is Image. Image satellite went up to space a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of months ago actually. It's quite recent. And we calculated the radiation doses it will receive around the Earth. Uh, for example, on the, on the left, you see the differential flux, flux of protons on the, on the right, you see the differential flux of electrons. And if you look at 1 MeV, you find at 1 MeV electrons, you'll find 300 of them per centimeter square per second. Whereas for electrons, you'll find 10,000 of them at the same energy. But I told you I was more worried about protons. And why is that? Because electrons, uh, this is on the x-axis, you have the aluminum thickness outside your satellite. On the y-axis, you have the dose received. And what you find is that your electrons, which are in green, with higher aluminum thickness of the satellite outside uh, your shielding, drop exponentially, whereas protons, due to relativity, will simply, after, they will simply go through without uh, stopping. So what you get in your satellite, inside your satellite, is generally actually protons. So, another, for example, here's an example we use generally, we use for uh, radiation dose calculations, we generally use Geon 4, which was developed at CERN, and as a particle physicist, we're quite used to using it. Um, so here is, for example, the radiation analysis of the solar panels of the image satellite, which was again developed, uh, they, there was an R&D project to develop solar panels in Turkey. And then we built a, a proton uh, irradiation center around uh, an accelerator which was bought from IBA, which I understand is 30 kilometers from here at your uh, fellow university. It was a spin-off from a fellow university. Uh, so we have a Cyclone 30 in Ankara, in Turkey, uh, to uh, make radioisotope production. Uh, it can go up to very high, high currents, which we don't use for radiation tests, obviously. That's used for radioisotope production. So uh, this Cyclone 30 at Tamak Nukan Proton Accelerator Facility has four rooms around it. It has a solid target room, a gaseous target room, and a liquid target room, which we don't use. We use this R&D room here. And we built a METU defocusing beam line uh, to enlarge the beam, uh, because uh, even, the smallest, even the smallest setting of the accelerator is quite a lot of protons. <clears throat> and to reduce the flux, and uh, then to measure the beam to make sure they're according to ESA standards. And we prov until now, we have re performed 38 tests for companies, research facilities, for different uh, partners uh, to test their electronics materials against uh, radiation in space, and now also uh, nuclear facilities. Okay, so this was our original design. After a beam stopper, a vacuum well, we have three quarter pole magnets which enlarge the beam. And then we have a, well, they actually, well, they, they, give a, they give an angle to the beam. And then the beam is enlarged with that angle in this flight path. And at the end, uh, you get an uh, enlarged beam. So the vacuum inside here is about 10 to the minus 6 millibar. And the cooling system 
for this whole thing was designed for a maximum B current of 100 microamperes. So the ASA requirement, which is 25100, uh, single event test effects, uh, say that you need to test um, uh, with proton kinetic energies between 220 20 and 200 MeV. And the reason is that's the maximum of the trap flux around the Earth. The irradiation area should be around the size of an A4 paper. The proton flux should be somewhere at least 10 to, uh, from, it should be somewhere between 10 to the 5 protons per centimeter squared per second to at least 10 to the 8 protons per centimeter per second. But what we've learned is that most of our users pick 10 to the 8 because it makes the test short. Uh, the flux uniformity should be better than 10%, and the fluence for one radiation should be about 10 to the proton, 10 to 11 protons per, per centimeter square. And the reason is that's about what you receive in about three to five years in LEO on an average orbit. Uh, the one thing that we cannot do is we cannot make a response curve. Uh, to, to do a response curve, you need five different energies between 20 and 200 MeV. We can only do uh, somewhere between uh, 15 and 30 MeV. So we can do only one energy, but it's a good beginning. It's a good start. Uh, the, as for the subsystems, we try to produce everything in-house uh, in Turkey. Um, and that made it cheap, actually, compared to what we would have uh, built it otherwise. Uh, we got a lot of help from CERN. So this was a CERN collaboration. Uh, we got our own uh, collaboration code from CERN uh, for this experiment. And uh, we built, we, we did all the beam optic simulations with CERN uh, using MADX and transport. Uh, with vacuum system, we built ourselves, the robotic system we built with a company in Turkey. Uh, test and measurement system, we got a lot, a lot of help from CERN again. We have three detectors. We have a diamond detector, a time picks built by CERN, and scintillating fibers, uh, which we built in-house at Metro. Uh, we scanned the beam with these three detectors to measure the flux of the beam. Uh, the control system we wrote ourselves in LabVIEW, and the cooling system we tried to uh, build it ourselves as well. And uh, we generally, for simulation programs, we use two programs to compare with each other to make sure to, to, to reduce our systematic error. Uh, our particle, uh, particle tracking was done with Turtle and G4 Beamline. Cooling we did only with ANSYS, and those in radius isotope studies we do with Fluca and MCMP. So this is, what now, uh, this is what the facility looks like right now. Uh, this makes, so we have, an, so here is the accelerator, and we have about a beam line of nine meters. So we get about 10 to, we get, uh, according to the user, we get 15 to 30 MeV protons. Generally, those who want to do materials want a higher let, a, a linear energy transfer, so they'll opt for 15 MeV. Those who want to study electronics want 30 MeV, so that it goes deeper into their electronics. Um, and we delivered this to an area of our A4 size paper for testing electronics and materials. So here is our uh, target area. And you see in the target area here, uh, we, ha we have a moving table where we can move in uh, different detectors or uh, different samples. And here's the shadow left by the beam on a gaff chromic film and has a size as required by ASA. And our proton flux is adjustable between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 11 protons per centimeter square per second. And most users ask for 10 to the 8 because that finishes the test in about 16 minutes. So that's quite nice and fast. So one of the things that we did um, is these two magnets we bought from Scandertronics. This third one is quite big and had to be custom made anyway. So we thought, let's try. Um, so we built this, we designed it in-house, uh, built it with a company in Turkey, uh, sent it to CERN for magnet tests, and this company is now, I think, applying or about to get um, to, to make some magnets for the SPS after finishing this project. Okay, and I have zero minutes left, uh, and uh, all of how many slides? I think three slides. Okay. Oh, sorry. So the third thing we do now is because we got to, to understand our radiation area, we were building radiation detectors, scintillators, silicon detectors. Um, and there's a fab lab in Turkey that makes some beautiful silicon 
uh, detectors. And we said, okay, we really want to understand the space radiation, so let's go to space and measure with small radiation counters on our satellites. We predict it, so let's see whether we can measure our predictions in space. So, um, and Turkey has a space program where we're building rockets to go to space. Um, so we decided to fly on rockets, and they said, go ahead, come along for the ride. So good. Um, so what do you go, if you, so x-axis is flux, y-axis is altitude. As you go up to space, you fly through this um, beautiful shower. And the shower, you see, as you shower, the number of, the multiplicity of particles increases. Okay, so you actually get a maximum at about 20 kilometers. So plus or minus a couple of kilometers. It changes with latitude. Uh, so this is called renegar Fotzer maximum. And uh, we decided, let's measure these things. So we built a very uh, simple detector, simple-minded. Uh, first, we have a Geiger counter outside. Uh, inside, inside this box, underneath this thinned aluminum cover, uh, we have two uh, large pad detectors, large pad silicon detectors. Here you see it. This was uh, produced by, this is um, by a fab lab, a silicon fab lab in Turkey, Tibitak Bilgam Ital. So we have two of them. And then at the bottom card, we have an FPGA, which counts the number of particles inside all these detectors, but also does coincidence amongst the silicon uh, counter. And uh, the silicon sensors, sensors we might have, we, we, we definitely over, over, overbuilt, and they can uh, count up to 10 to the 30, 10, 10 to the 7 protons per second, because one day we want to fly inside the Van Allen belts, so we want to get ready for that already. And we have a volume like this, and a mass about 500 grams. So we flew this on two flights uh, from the Black Sea, uh, up to 137 kilometers. Uh, so, uh, so here, so these on on the left you see uh, as we went up to space, and this is as we went down into the Black Sea. So, on this on this panel you see uh, the dose rate went from about 0 0.1 microgray per hour to about two microgray per hour, uh, so a factor of about 40. Uh, up to the Fotzer maximum of 20 kilometers, and then you see, and then you see some statistical variations as we go up, and then as we go down, you see the Fotzer maximum again, and then we hit the Black Sea. As for the the proton detectors inside, there's so few protons that it's statistical fluctuations, unfortunately, but it's consistent with the proton flux. Uh, as I said, the rocket goes fast, right? So. Okay, so you, you understand, I think. And, uh, but you see some rate. Uh, what I can tell you is that as we were sitting on the ground, there were no protons for three days. So that's good. Um, now, we, of course, you see we have, for our next flight, there's work to be done. As uh, we had a high and a low threshold, uh, we had a top and a bottom detector. Obviously, the top has more hits than the bottom. That makes sense because as a proton, some of them stop on the... So the top uh, silicon sensor was sensitive within a range of 15 MeV to 25 MeV, and the bottom was sensitive to protons above 30 MeV. Uh, so you see that the, the bottom sees less, fewer protons, uh, the top sees more. But again, we have to do, we have to work a little bit more. You see we're heating up. Uh, you see that our, our noise is increasing on our low threshold. So, so we're looking forward to our next flight, which will be at, uh, sometime by the end of this year or next year sometime. We're going to go up to 350 kilometers again uh, this time, uh, not per, on, again, a parabolic flight. And then we, we hope uh, the Turkish space program hopes to uh, make orbit in 2027. So we'll go into orbit with a satellite in 2027. So, um, so last but not least, <laughs> Uh, I'm really interested and excited about science diplomacy and the power of international collaborations, as that's why I'm here. I'm, I would love to collaborate with you. We've been collaborating with CERN since a long time. Uh, we became an associate member of CERN in 2015, and this was the first collaboration 
signed under that agreement. So, uh, to, which allowed for knowledge and technology transfer to CERN. So, uh, I would like to continue this tradition. And of course, uh, it's a team effort. I'm just one of the 20 people working uh, in our center. Uh, so, I wanted to show you a photo. Uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of you will sympathize with the thickness of our reports to funding agency. Uh, and I would like to thank the Ministry of Development for funding us and also Tem Maknukan for letting us use their accelerator. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. And sorry about being over time by about five minutes. Uh, well, thank you for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, panel of yeah, different experiments, different uh, uh, topics from basically bridging the really applied science to understand uh, uh, particle physics to uh, the, the fundamental science to understand particle physics to some really applied uh, uh, experiments. Uh, are there questions in the audience? And if there are questions, can you repeat them before answering them so that the microphone will enable you? Sure, thank you very much. Can you uh, tell us a little more about the different signatures in the different detectors? Place where you expected questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, any, uh, he, so, uh, to repeat the question for those online, uh, he wanted me to explain the slide better. Anything in particular? All right, so the most, the one that I consider the most interesting, obviously, is the positrons. There's very few of them. Uh, the sun doesn't make a lot of them, makes some of them, yeah. We, uh, on the Earth, there's quite a few, unless you go into a pet machine. So uh, positrons are the most interesting, as they're the antimatter of electrons. And, why, and what we, how we distinguish them from the major background. So on, in space at high energies, the most major background are protons. Okay, so how do you distinguish them from protons? Anything higher than one, uh, higher, anything higher than a charge of one, we can easily get rid of in our data, right? So because we know that if you have a charge of two, immediately you get uh, more uh, DEDX or energy deposition, or you get uh, you see it in all detectors, higher charges. So you get rid of higher charges. So charge of one. you have to do a better job, right? And then, of course, you can say, well, hold on, I, I know a positron from an electron because it curves, but then occasionally it scatters inside your, electron, uh, inside your detector and you get charge confusion. So this is why you have to do a good job. You have to make sure that you do a good job. So how do you do that? Is by In the transition radiation detector, it really helps below one TeV because a positron inside this uh, will produce transition radiation photons. Everybody know what a transition photon is? Transition radiation photon? Okay. Everybody has the book Jackson? No? No? Okay. All right. So it, it, Jackson, J.D. Jackson, electro, electrodynamics. Okay. So it's the last chapter. If anybody wants to look it up, <laughs> but but that's 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 my main reference. But um. Uh, so when a particle, so in physics, um, almost everything goes with beta, right? When you when you look at um, when you look at um, relativity, quantum relativ relativ uh, electrodynamics, you find that most effects goes with beta, or radiation effects, uh, beta blow, right? Gamma doesn't come into effect a lot. Uh, in a way, so if you have a particle, a, prot a proton that's 100 GeV versus a positron that's 100 GeV, there's very little things that can distinguish this from an electromagnetic perspective. So the thing that really distinguishes them is the transition radiation. The moment that you put some material in front of it, because of the shock wave, that this electromagnetic wave around the particle carries with itself, right, an electromagnetic field, and this field has to readjust itself as it goes into this material. 
And this makes a shock wave inside this material. And that is actually an X-ray. It emits an X-ray with a probability of exactly alpha, which I find fascinating. This is one of the very few places you find alpha naked. The probability is really 1 over 137. Um, so that's why you need to put 100 inter interfaces in front of it to get one X-ray. So what we do is we these particles, we put 137 inter interfaces in front of it. And how we do this is by fleece. You know these fleece jackets you put on? That material has a lot of transitions, yeah? So we put fleece radiator, we call it radiator, <coughs> with about, about, about 137 transitions. And then because it makes an X-ray, but very soft X-ray, 7 kV to 15 kV, that's soft, yeah? So to see that X-ray, then we put uh, straw tubes. And if you say what a straw tube is, it's like the pipette that you, you, you uh, drink <laughs> your Coca-Cola through. So imagine a really thin pipette, and inside it, a proportional tube filled with xenon CO2. Why xenon? Xenon is the one that, pre that has the highest cross-section. Xenon gas is the highest cross-section for absorbing X-rays. So you put xenon CO2 gas inside this thing to stop that X-ray. Okay, to make, you make sure that the, the, it's really thin outside and you really get the X-ray inside. So if you do this, 100 GV positron will, because it has a high gamma, yeah, energy divided by mass is huge, generates incredible number of transition radiation photons, whereas a proton has a gamma of only 100. And the funny thing is that transition radiation has a really a cutoff at about a gamma of 1,000. So if your gamma is higher than 1,000, you generate transition radiation photons. OK, I'm lying a little bit. You, the truth is that even below 1,000, you make them, but their energy is so low that you can't see them. OK, so, so this is why. So this is the transition radiation. So that's really where you really distinguish them. And the rest is colorimeter I explained already, I think. Okay, I, I gave it too long an answer. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, anyone? Yes. Um, I'm curious about uh, the same experts that you potentially attribute to dark matter measured by AMS. So can you get any idea of the anisotropy of the, these properties of the particles? Because I guess that can distinguish between galactic and extragalactic phenomena. Um, Thank you very much for that question. There's a beautiful group inside AMS, our colleagues, who are working on anisotropy, and it's a very hard analysis, and I, I applaud them for it. Um, so far, we haven't seen an anisotropy. So far. But we have to collect more statistics because we're not... We're not statistical... Statistic, sorry. Our anisotropy measurement isn't at a stage where it would be statistically significant as then you have already very few positrons, yeah? and then you divide up the sky into one degree, one degrees, and then, so the statistics in every bit of the sky is quite low, so we have to collect more statistics. We have a paper on it, you can look it up, uh, but right now we haven't seen any isotropy in the, we haven't seen any particular uh, direction in which the positrons are coming from. But then again, this is, this is unlike, uh, positrons are unlike uh, photons, right? Because there is magnetic fields that complicate things. Uh, positrons follow the magnetic fields in the galaxy. So we might be blind after a certain a distance to, this, to a certain isotropy. Still the case around 1,000 GeV, that the galactic magnetic fields at very high energies, the deflections yes. you get would be smaller, right? Yes, it is. At high, oh, sorry, let me repeat. Uh, at higher energies, the deflections you get is, of course, smaller, yes. Okay. So, and uh, I can refer you to this particular uh, publication we have. I'm not an expert on the measurement, yes. The AMS is located on the ISS, which is in a low Earth orbit. How representative then is the measurement? Aren't you already partially affected by the proximity to Earth in your observations? 
So Toma asks me how, um, because we're because the AMS is in low Earth orbit, how affected we are by the Earth's geomagnetic environment. Uh, so thank you very much. So the Earth's geomagnetic environment uh, has gives us a geomagnetic cutoff below and above which we have different spectra due to the trapping of particles by the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so above 10 GeV, nothing. So that's the answer. The simple answer is below 10 GeV, you're safe. It uh, doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter your geomagnetic latitude. But above, below 10 GeV, Depending on where you are in geomagnetic latitude, you will see primaries in certain geomagnetic latitudes and you will see secondaries in certain geomagnetic latitudes. So that's the complicated answer. And then it gets complicated. And then it gets complex after that, right? Because AMS takes data depending on, so we, our, geomagnetic, our, geomagnetic, our geomagnetic cutoff depends on the magnetic latitude in which we are. I applaud you for catching that. That's amazing. <laughs> so AMS-01 was a small flight, it was a short flight to the International Space Station Mir. Are we allowed to mention that now? <laughs> In 1998, uh, just for 10 days. So it was, it went up on the, it went, we, so we didn't have a transition radiation detector. We didn't have a colorimeter. Hold on, we had a colorimeter. Sorry, see, I'm not so well versed in that even. Well, it was a precursor of light. Oh, so I feel awful now. Um, well, we had a magnet, the same magnet actually. Uh, and we had silicon tracker, a silicon tracker inside. So it was a, still a magnetic spectrometer, but it flew only for 10 days and it collected data for eight, if, I, if my memory serves me right. All right. Thank you very much. So we're statistics limited and systematics limited, right? There are two limits. So clearly we are, you can see that it's statistics limited right now to some extent. Um, so so the first part of my answer would be that in two years we'll have an upgrade. We'll go up to three meters square stair radians. So that will increase the statistics we're collecting by about a factor of three. So that's good, up until the end of the International Space Station. And maybe it gets prolonged. Uh, so we're very hopeful about that because we're quite radiation tolerant. Uh, all our detectors are working really well. We had already an upgrade to change of few malfunctioning electronics in our cooling system, but all is well right now. So we're confident that we will last and be able to take good data until the very end. Um, and by the end of that, by the end of 2030, we uh, will be able to distinguish between the published current models coming from dark matter and the ones from pulsars. So we will be able to tell you whether that tail extends out or is a sharp cutoff. Uh, so in 2030. But if you gave me more money, <laughs> <laughs> I will always take it. Uh, so there is a proposal by uh, some of our colleagues from, led by uh, the Ahan group inside AMS for AMS 100. This is on the archive if you want to look, up, look it up, AMS 100. And it's a 100 ton detector at L2. And it's a beautiful tracker and a colorimeter system, which then would reduce also the systematic error bars uh, and would be able to tell us up to uh, tens of TeV.
what the spectrum looks like. And well, then we would be even more sensitive to even higher energy uh, exciting particle physics phenomena. More than happy to block James Webb anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Uh, in space, you have a mixed radiation environment. And depending on which, uh, which orbit you're in, you get a different mixture. So you want to do, you want to be able to stop the mixture with one beautiful material that you invent. And then also, one of the things that we often forget are the secondaries. As I'm sure the nuclear scientists amongst you will confirm, neutrons are really pesky things. Um, and you get actually a neutron gas inside satellites, which keep on bouncing around. So uh, because I'm in Turkey, we have a lot of interest and funding for boron-related materials, as we have the world's largest boron deposits. Uh, so we're right now working on, uh, we actually have, no. Oh, we're working on, we have three patents on, uh, boron-based radiation shields. So mixing boron into high-density polyethylene with other materials, uh, founding materials and metals. So this is, this is something that we're working on, as boron is great for stopping neutrons. Um, so that's another special interest. And uh, to, to not to shield the whole satellite, right? Shielding the whole satellite is expensive. But... If you know some components are okay under radiation, and you know you have a couple of very sensitive components, you just want to be able to go and shield those components, and that's going to be cheaper and light, lighter weight. So this is kind of what we're working on right now. But it's work under progress. Very good, thank, you. thank you very much for that question. All right, I think it's time to uh, thank our speaker. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.